While you're still standing, I'm going to read for you chapter 61, and we're going to read verse 1 as I get on to the word of God. I know that the Lord is here to bind up the brokenhearted. I don't care who hurt you, how they hurt you. I don't care what they used to hurt you. I don't care how much walls you've put ahead and besides and behind and inside of you. Many have put walls around and have declared never again. The Lord sent me to let you know all those walls are coming down today because you're going to be confident in your God. You're going to be comfortable in your God in the name of Jesus. Isaiah 61. Hey, somebody's going to get healed today. God is here. I tell you, somebody's going to get healed today. You will not leave I tell you, God is going to heal you today in the name of Jesus. You will cry tears of joy in the name of Jesus. Somebody say hallelujah. I want us to read it together. Two, three, go. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. I want you to leave the comfort of your seat one more time, and I want you to just tell a few sister girls in this house, he's going to bind up your broken heart. He's going to bind up your broken heart. Come on, tell somebody. You don't know that that person has cried all night. They just don't look it. You don't know that that person has been waiting on God for years. You, they don't look it. You don't know that that person that you're telling, you're delivering them right now. Say it one more time and just tell somebody the Lord is going to bind up your broken heart in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Somebody say hallelujah in the name of Jesus. And then I want you to sit on your enemies forever. Lift up your voice and say, binding the brokenhearted. Now the Hebrew word for broken in Isaiah 61 is shava. Shava, meaning to burst or to break into pieces, to wreck or to crush or to rend, to tear in pieces. Have those words ever described your heart? Has th have those words ever described your heart? Has your heart felt as if it was broken into tiny little pieces? Have you ever gotten to a point where these words of uh, Shava were describing your own very heart? Now, many people in the church and in the world around are actually nursing wounded hearts. They are nursing wounded hearts. Some of the hearts are so deep-rooted. Some of the pain 
pain is so deep rooted and the heartache is so deep rooted because they have been afflicted by experiences that they suffered in their early years of life. Some having been deprived of parental love. There are so many that are here all grown up but were deprived of parental love and left to grow themselves at the mercies of God. I met a woman the other day and she said to me she started to take care of her siblings at the age of seven. She said that her mother went to be with the Lord when she was only seven and then suddenly her father disappeared and as such she was the one now fending and taking care of the little siblings and she was only seven years old herself. Scientists say that a child's brain is programmed between the age of zero to seven years and as such uh, many people who are unfortunately have been uh, 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 programmed to pain from such tender ages. I want you to know that between zero and seven that is when you instill values on your babies when they are zero to seven and many times we wait for them to grow up in order to begin to train them but I want you to know between the age of zero and seven that is when life really is happening on that child and so when the child's memory is filled with hurt and pain from that age it is something that many times they carry for the rest of their life and these uh, childhood pains have uh, mutated to fears and deep-seated insecurities that if not dealt with are dealing with a lot of many people's lives they are ruining a lot of many people's uh, lives somebody say amen lift up your voice and say a better hallelujah look at your friend next to you and tell them it's all right with you the stories of grown-ups looking for daddies has been told over and over and over again. Fathers, uh, the, the, the kids or ladies that are looking for father figures are too many even to start counting. Themselves in distress are still dealing with daddy issues and there are too many for us to be able to ignore. And the Lord said to me, there are a lot of women even in the house of God right now in the daughters of Zion that are still struggling and grappling with father issues, daddy issues and many times we can ignore them but they are crushing the mature women. Then there are stories of people abused as babies, children that are abused and losing their innocence to people that should have taken care of them. They are so many, so many daughters of Zion, so many women all over the world that have been abused at the hands of people that were supposed to take care of them. No matter how old you are, no matter how old you grow, the, 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 the challenge of rubbing those feelings away becomes virtually impossible. And so there are so many people, they are so grown, but they still feel unloved. Why? Why? Because the people that were supposed to watch over them began to abuse them. There is so many people even in the house of God that are looking for identity. They are walking. They are grown up. They look big. They look all together lovely. They look like everything is in place. But they suffer from identity crisis. They have no idea who they are. Why? Because their innocence was abused by the very people that they loved. I don't want to start going that direction because it's a direction that hurts me even as I minister about it. I want you to know that there are so many and the enemy loves to take advantage of such people and causes them to run from one horrible relationship to another horrible relationship. Why? Because they have purposed that it's going to work out. Why? Because the abuser told them that it was 
their fault that they were abused. And as such, they are always looking to see whether there is somebody that's going to be okay and nice to them. Why? Because they feel that there is something they need to deal with. And how do I deal with such a situation? I can only deal with it by looking for somebody else who is going to approve of me. So you find them in their maturity still dealing with their seven-year-old self. You find them in their places of work. They are bosses actually. They are the boss lady, but they are dealing with their seven-year-old selves. To cope, they act out in anger because you see, women have a, far, a very powerful mechanism. And what do we do? Many times when we don't want to deal with something, we put it at the back of our mind and act like it never happened. We act like we are okay with it. We act like it's all right. I've dealt with it. But a lot of women are coming out angry. They are angry. They are bitter. Why? Because in the hands of people that should have loved them, that same people destroyed them. Can we talk today? They feign a sense of self-sufficiency. Why? Because they don't want to interact with people. You think that they are self-sufficient and you think that they are loners. You think that they don't want anybody's company. They are okay by themselves. No, honey, they are running from something. And so they don't need anyone. They act like they don't need anyone. And they become hardened and hard to persuade. They become hardened and hard to persuade. And in secret, they struggle with what you call sinful tendencies. Why? Because for you to fill up a gap, you run into something else. Something that you feel can sort you. Sometimes it's another man. Sometimes it's a man married man. Sometimes it's alcohol. Sometimes it's a smoking. Sometimes it's a drug. Sometimes it's uh, bad friends. Sometimes it's bad company. Why? Because if somebody's bad, you want to be better than them. Why? Because you want to cover up and feel okay even in the midst of your heartache. And so many people rush into addictions and many people get depressed and there are so many hearts that are broken. So many hearts that are bleeding and this is so because a broken heart will always seek solace in the most unlikely places and what is worse is that if you have a broken heart I'm telling you you will not survive a marriage I want you to hear me clearly, church. If you have a broken heart, you are so used to being broken by this and that and that and the other, you cannot survive a marriage. Why? Because you are expecting a man to do what only God can do. As painful as it might be, parental neglect and childhood pains don't represent the love of God. I want you to understand that our heavenly father said according to his word in the book of Psalm 27 and verse 10. That when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. I want you to know that parental neglect can never touch the love of God over your life. Lift up your voice and say a better hallelujah. It is important for you to know that God the father will never leave you nor forsake you. And his love does not represent that of your parents that neglected you. I want you to know that his love is real. So don't run away from him. Because this is what he said. That many run away from him. They run right into the hands of another man. Not knowing that that man is going to be another abuser. And so many are heartbroken because you're running to the hands of money. You're running to the hands of friends. You're running to the hands of a, a, a family. You're running to other hands. God said, no, stop running away from the very God that wants to bring a healing unto your life. I decree in the name of Jesus. That you shall not leave this house a broken heart. You shall leave this house already sorted in the name of Jesus. Somebody say hallelujah. Don't run away from him. In the declaration of his mandate, Jesus said 
that he has been anointed among other things to heal the broken hearted. The reason that he was anointed among other things was to heal the broken hearted. Jesus Christ didn't come just for the salvation of your soul. No. He came for the healing of your body and his specific mandate was to get into your heart and heal all the pains and the wounds of your heart. There is a divine resource to patch up together all the broken fragments of your heart and begin to repair them. Somebody say I'm about to be repaired. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, I am suffering from a different type of pain. My heart was not wounded in my formative years. My father took care of me. My mother took care of me. For me, it wasn't in the formative years. But I want to let you know, there are so many people that are hurting because life happened. If it didn't happen in your formative years, life happened at some point in life. Somebody say, preach to me, mama. Lift up your voice and say, preach to me today. No matter the pain you're having, the Spirit of God sent me to let you know He is going to cover up and heal every pain in the mighty name of Jesus. Whatever you're ailing from, He sent me to let you know He is here to bring a healing all around you in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. And so today, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is potent enough. The power of Jesus is potent enough to heal all your pains. So I want us to look at some few pains before we get into the gist of the healing that Jesus wants to, uh, to do over here. Number one is the pain of sin. The pain of sin. The pain of sin. According to Psalm chapter 51 and verse 17. What does the Bible say? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. We might not all claim to be victims of childhood wounds. But the power of sin has broken each one of us in one way or another. The power of sin at some point has broken each one of us in one way or another. That feeling of my goodness, how can I do this to God? And yet God has helped me with such high esteem. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt, how can I even appear in the house of God when I've been so bad? I've done all manner of things. I've been so terrible. And God has watched me and yet he loves me. How can I be so bad to such a loving God? That feeling of disappointing ourselves for doing what we should not have done. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Disappointing yourself and wondering, God, how can you even love me? That feeling of disappointing your family. That feeling of disappointing the people that love you. That feeling that uh, caused Adam and Eve to run away. You know that feeling of, God, how can I even appear before you? Because that's what sin does. You know, this morning we were talking with my husband. And there's something that we said. Uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, today's not going to be a shouty message. I want it to be a healing message. I want every person to leave this house totally healed and set free. Because sometimes it's not about shouting. And we, uh, you know, we, we, sometimes we can make you shout and jump on the seats and all over. But I want to let you know that is not the issue. I want you to know even if you're going to jump at any one time, you better jump to your healing. You better jump to deliverance. You better jump to a newness. You better jump to a new person. Somebody say amen. And we were talking this morning with my husband and we were saying, isn't it amazing that, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the difference between a, a sheep and, and, and a pig. Isn't it amazing how a sheep and a pig are so different? You know, when a sheep uh, falls into murky places, if it falls into dirt, the sheep begins to cry. It begins to cry. Why? Because it wants to come out. It doesn't. It's not happy about being in the mud. It's not happy about being in that quagmire and it's not. So it starts to cry and it starts to call out for the shepherd. Like, please get me out of this mess. I don't want to be here. But when a pig falls into a messy situation, 
What does the pig do? It rejoices. It's like I'm home. It begins to go, to go into mud and make it even worse. And it, it, have you ever seen a pig? I mean, it, it eats anything. It goes crazy. Why? Because it's, it, it's not disturbed by the dirt. But when a person that loves God, you love God and you know that you love God. When that person falls into sin, they feel so bad. They start to wonder, God, why? They start to wonder, why couldn't I stop myself? And I want you to understand that the, the pain of sin is not a joke. It's a mighty pain because you're feeling bad that you even did what it is that you do. I believe that's, why the reason, that's the reason why Adam and Eve were running away from God. Because God, how? How could we do such a stupid thing? That feeling is not a strange feeling to all of us. Anybody ever done something stupid even as much as last night? Uh-huh. Keep looking at me. Ain't nobody gonna know I'm talking to you, baby. Just keep looking directly at me straight forward and say, yes, mama, preach. And everybody's gonna think you're not even, come on, somebody. But we all know that there are sometimes we do things that hurt us. Something called sin begins to hurt us. And if you are freshly dealing with the pain that sin inflicts in your soul, it is important to let you know what the Bible says. Listen to what the Bible says. According to 1 John, I tell you I love God. I love God with all of my heart. Because you know what? God is not raising perfect vessels. And we should never be here condemning each other. We should never be here putting each other down. When somebody falls, you must be the one to pick them up and let them know it is well with you. You must be the one to wipe their dirt and tell them, you know what? I can see that you're going to make it. You don't have to wallow in this man. You don't have to cry in self-pity. I am here as your sister to let you know you're better than that. You're bigger than that. You don't have to die in that sin. You don't have to die in that pain. But Christians are the ones that kill their wounded soldiers. Yet the Bible tells us that a righteous man may fall seven times. But each time they rise up again. I don't care how many times you've fallen. If God says you're rising up again, I decree that that sin will not kill you. I say that sin is not going to kill you. God has not called me. To condemn the brethren. There is only one who is an accuser of the brethren. And that is the devil himself. I refuse for daughters to, 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 to unite with the devil. To put down other daughters. If a daughter has fallen. It is your responsibility to raise them up. So what they got pregnant out of wedlock. Even if you did what they were doing. It's just that you didn't get pregnant. You see, that's the only problem. And the people who point fingers are worse than anybody else. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, I'm not going to point fingers at you. Don't four point fingers at Because you see, we pretend to be nice in the house of God. When somebody goes off, we are crazy. Did you see? Oh my God, did you see so and so? Listen to me, you are also so and so. When you point one finger, there are four fingers pointing at you. Let us be lovers of God that can raise one another. You don't have to die in your sin. You don't have to die in your pain. You can rise up. I don't care how deep the, the sin is. It doesn't matter. Listen to what the Bible says. First John chapter 3 verse 20. Hey! Listen to what the Bible says. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and he knoweth all things. I decree from today, your heart shall not condemn you again for any sin that you have committed. You are, let me say that one more time. I decree your heart shall not condemn you again. I want you to understand the secret of restoring one's heart is to run to him that offers our broken hearts as a sacrifice. You need to understand he desires for us to offer our broken hearts as a sacrifice. Never allow sin to drive you away from the presence of God. This is where the problem is. People are running from God instead of to God. When you run from God, 
You behave like that pig and the devil whoops you clearly. But when you run towards God, he says your heart should not condemn you because your God is bigger than your heart. And he knows, read it with me, if our heart condemns us, God is greater and knows. Lift up your heart, tell them my God knows. Say it is well with me. So I came to let you know even if you woke up from somebody's bed last night. Let me, let me preach so that you can understand. Listen, Psalms 34 verse 18. The Bible says the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. And save such as I have a contrite spirit. Number two, the pain of reproach. This is where I went ahead of myself. Now I've come to pick myself. And go to the ones, lift up your voice and say the pain of reproach. Maybe you have made peace with God where sin is concerned. You have repented and sought his mercy. And you have his assurance that you are forgiven. And maybe the issue is not how God and how you see yourself. No, the issue is how others are looking at you. They don't know that yes, yesterday I was a bad sinner, but at night I repented. And when I repented, my God told me it is over. I came to let you know those that are reproaching you need the mercy of God themselves. Lift up your voice and say hallelujah. Lift it up one more time and say a better hallelujah. They know when and how you sinned. But they don't know when and how you repented. They know who and how you sinned with. But they don't know when and how God forgave you. They know because they saw you doing all manner of things. And have you ever known that when somebody has seen you making a mistake, in their eyes you become the mistake. And a lot of heartaches are because when you went to the office, the mistake you made became an office program. Every time you passed, you were the talk. Anybody ever been involved with that kind of reproach? The people that should, you know what? Do you know the pain that hurts people the most? It's not even the sin. Neither is it the haters. It is the friends that should have said something But they said nothing. It is the friends that should have stood for you. But they said nothing. When your story was being spoken about, they knew the truth. But they kept quiet. I don't know who I came for today. But I came to let you know you shall not be reproached. The Spirit of God sent me to let you know you shall not be reproached again in the name of Jesus. Lift up your voice and lift it up to Jesus and say, thank you, Jesus. What do you do when, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when your haters have a dossier of where you're coming from? <laughs> when they have a dossier of what you've done in life? You know, there's nothing as bad as people knowing what you did. And instead of covering and protecting you, they are the ones who are sending some buzzering. Uh, to me, I know the full, ah, 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 you, that's half the story. I know it all. Me, I know the full story. Auna copy, auna copy. Hey, me, I have a full copy. Lift up your voice, tell your neighbor, I shall not reproach you. <laughs> Even if I have a copy. <laughs> Listen, do you know the pain of reproach becomes more painful when people are speaking against you and they don't even know what it is that they are saying. But listen to what Psalm 69 and verse 20 says. It says, reproach has broken my heart and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. Something about reproach is not the pain of what haters say, but the silence of the betrayers. People that you love, that have been silent. That moment that you cannot get comfort from anyone, any of the so-called friends. So many hearts are broken 
Because people that you thought would bite the bullet for you are actually the ones who have turned against you. I don't know if, I, uh, if there is somebody here whose family has ever gone against you. People that you know, they know the truth, but they have decided to stand against you and reproach you and begin to send things over your life as if they don't know. And you're thinking, even you? Even you? Really, even you? I remember like uh, two years ago, we went through a, 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 a story. It was even, they even put it in the newspaper and they started saying a lot of crap, you know, because when you're a leader, you're going to hear some stuff. There is no leadership that's easy. Even ushering. As long as you're a leader. If whatever leadership, even prefect in class, there is no, <laughs> she says, there is no leadership that is easy. As long as you're a leader, you shall be beaten by people. People who don't understand you. So watch this now. When they started to talk and they started to say things about Bishop and I that were not true. And they put a photograph of Bishop with my daughter. Stephanie in the newspaper. I wish they go even got another picture to lie. If you're lying, lie properly. I, I, do you understand? Do you know they, become, they became such a laughing stock because they took a picture of Bishop and Stephanie. And put it and said, ah, he has a clande. This is the clande. <laughs> we laughed. We were rolling on the floor. Because now, because I'm the one who took that picture as they were posing. We were in Mombasa. Listen to me. So what this now? So they wrote and they said, and they said, huh? And they said, what? And they said, what? So we now rose up and said, guess what? We are suing you. And guess what? I won't say where we were suing. Watch this now. When we said we were suing, they are... You know what? They wrote an apology in the same newspaper that took 30 days. It was there for 30 days. Guess? Nobody saw the apology. Everybody just saw the reproach. I came to let you know it doesn't matter who reproaches you. If God vindicates you, he's going to vindicate you well and good. It doesn't matter who's talking against you. I came to let you know, you stay in the lane of God. He's going to fight for you. He's going to take away that pain of reproach. Lift up your voice and say, yay! But what hurt the most was that the people that should have stood with us stood against us. I came to let you know you must make a deliberate choice for you to have a pure heart before God. Somebody lift up your voice and say hallelujah. Proverbs 26 and verse 22. What does the Bible say? The words of a tell bearer are as wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. To add salt to injury, you realize that your mistakes are making rounds in the mouths of people. And this is what is going on even in the daughters of Zion. And at the end of the day, they are feeling deeply hurt down below their belly. And they are feeling deeply hurt. And some people never really recover from reproach. There are people who never recover from reproach. They feel reproach because people spoke against them and they never really recover. I came for such to let you know I don't care who said what and how they said it. Jesus sent me to let you know he is here to heal you tonight in the name of Jesus. Lift up your voice and say a better hallelujah. Lift it up and say a better hallelujah. In the church it is important to remind people that they are not a mistake just because they made a mistake. A lot of people feel like they are a mistake because of the mistakes they made. Let me rise up as a prophet of God and declare that you could have made a mistake, but you're not a mistake. I don't care how many mistakes you've made. You are not a mistake. Lift up your voice and say a better hallelujah. Truth be, to be told, many of us have sat under the master of the school called mistake. I don't know how many of you have never made a mistake in life. I have made many, but I'm not a mistake. Hey, Shana, I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but I want you to open your mouth and say, I, I am not a mistake. You better say it like a warrior. Let every devil hear that you know what you're saying. Say it one more time. I Lift up your voice. Say it one more time. Sometimes we learn the hard way. Sometimes we learn the hard way through mistakes, but we learn nevertheless. Sometimes it takes mistakes. 
for us to become who we are. Many of the low dead people will tell you, before they got there, they made grievous mistakes. But the mistake is what made them who they are today. You're not a mistake. You may have made it, but you're not a mistake. Lift up your voice and say hallelujah. Am I, am I talking to somebody in the house of God? I want you to know it is the burnt fingers that produced skilled hands. Burnt fingers produce skilled hands. So don't worry about the mistake. We have all made mistakes. And those who are mocking you right next to you are the ones who have made more grievous mistakes. But they just want somebody to climb on. I want you to know that you're not a mistake. Number three, the pain of lack. The pain of lack. Do you know there is no pain that hurts as the pain of lack? My God, <laughs> the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, Psalms 109 verse 22. For I am poor and needy and my heart is wounded within me. I want you to know the source of untold uh, misery is penury and lack. Poverty is not just a reproach. It is the source of untold pain. There is nothing more painful than having to be housed by somebody and kept in somebody's house. You don't even have freedom to use the toilet. Because the time you're entering the toilet is when the owner wants it. There is no freedom to eat food. Because you're feeling you're eating a lot and maybe it's not, am I talking to somebody? There is no reproach that you feel so bad. There is no pain than the pain of poverty. It's a painful situation. I've been there. When my own children are asking me even for bread. And I'm looking for bread as we are passing by. And I can't get it out of the shop for my children. There is nothing worse. There is nothing as bad as being kept in somebody's house. You are sleeping on the floor. It is your, your dignity is stripped off completely. There is nothing as painful as that. I remember we would walk in the city center. And my husband would go with tears rolling off his face. And he would be asking me, what kind of a man am I? And I'm tempted to say, I don't know. <laughs> Very tempted. To say, me too, I'm confused. <laughs> I don't know what kind of a... He would say, who, which man does not afford things for his house, his wife, even pads. And I say, me too, I'm struggling in my spirit. <laughs> I'm struggling to understand that kind of a man. But you know, God gave me the strength to be able to stand by him. The shame of struggling to make ends meet. You know what that does? It hurts your heart. Your heart gets in pain. The shame of dropping, going to drop people, uh, children to school. And they are told, go back home. And you're called. And, and, and you're told, go back home. And you're feeling so, you don't even know what to do. I remember, I was going home with Vanessa crying. I'm weeping. And she's six years old. In standard one, she's asking me, mommy, what is it? I cannot explain. We can, I'm telling her you'll go back one day. Guess what? Every time my daughter's story was, Mommy, is the wilderness over? Because you get to such a wilderness that you have to explain to your children <laughs> that there is a wilderness. So every night, Vanessa would ask, Daddy, is wilderness over? She has no idea. Is wilderness gone? Are we still in wilderness? When am I going to school? When the wilderness is over. When is it over? Man, you're looking and you're thinking, how degrading is it? The neighboring kids would run to my daughter and ask her where Mbona Wenagi Shule. Because we are sleeping in their place and they can see we are sleeping on the floor. And they are laughing and mocking at my children. Vanessa and Stephanie. Stephanie was three. And they are wondering, how come you don't go to school? When they are going to school. It's, uh, it's embarrassing. And it's painful. And it leaves scars in your heart. And you feel wounded. 
When people are telling you, why can't you use your common sense? Both my husband and I were called and asked by the people we love. If one of you was mad, why does the other one have to follow in the madness? <laughs> why can't one be mad? Then the other one helps them out. Now both of you are mad. You've both lost your senses. Have you ever been out of school? No. What is it that you can have children out of school and embarrass us? And it wasn't for a month. It wasn't for two months. It wasn't for three. For a whole year, our children were out of school. We became their laughing stock. I know the pain that black brings in somebody's life. Using a bit latrine. That we had to whistle. Who, 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 whistling. Because there was no door. It was, we are not whistling for the joy of the Lord. <laughs> we are whistling because there is no door that the, somebody can see you from far. <laughs> there is a semblance of a door. <laughs> but it's just a semblance. And so people can see. So you have to whistle for them not to come close enough because they will come and see you in operation. <laughs> if they come close enough. And then you have to wash with little water. Throwing it like this, Kionus. Because you can't wash properly. Water was coming twice a week. Uh-huh. Your children are questioning you. Life is questioning you. I know the pain of luck. You cannot afford to even pay attention. Forget pay anything. <laughs> the shame of struggling. To make ends meet. I know that shame so well. And I tell you. you have The pain of having to borrow. Literally everything. You have to borrow fare. You have to borrow food. You have to borrow everything. Literally everything. You have to borrow it. You are like non-existent. You just have to borrow to keep surviving. There is nothing as inhumane. As that in life. And what does it do? It scars you. And today, I came to talk to every person that is in that place of luck. To let you know today, Jehovah is going to turn it around for you. In the name of Messiah. Let me repeat that again. I said, Jehovah is going to turn it around for you. Poverty can hurt someone so deep that if not checked, it can lead you to a life of despondency and total despair. It can lead you to a place of not believing in yourself or believing in God, that God can turn anything around. But I don't want you to forget something that the Bible says according to Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 8. And I had Pastor Joanne quote it when I was coming because I was coming and I was watching and I had Pastor Joanne quote this. And she said, he raises up the poor out of the dust and lifted up the beggar from the dunghill. To set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. I don't know who I came for. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. I came to let you know you are about to rise up as a prince. I said you are about to dine with princes in the name of Jesus. Let me repeat that again for somebody who did not hear Emma's testimony. When a prophet prophesies, you better not sit put. You better receive it hard in the name of Jesus. I said you shall not walk in poverty another year. The pain of poverty shall not be your portion. The pain of lack shall not be your portion. You shall not be the laughing stock of your family in the name of Jesus. You shall not be known as a beggar. They are about to know you as a lender to the nations. Your life is about to turn around in the name of Jesus. Let me prophesy with my eyes open. I am not where I used to be because the God I'm preaching about turned my captivity around. He gave me a scripture according to Psalms 126 and it says when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. That was my scripture. I stood on it. I slept on it. I jumped on it. I spoke it. And today I have come to raise up 
a, a horn from heaven and let every daughter of Zion know your captivity is going to be turned around. You will not die without making impact in your generations. You will not miss out on your visitation in the name of Jesus. I command every anger, every bitterness to live your life in the name of Jesus. Stop looking at people that hurt you. Begin to look at the one who is able to wipe every tear in the name of Jesus. Lift up your voice and say, yay. I want you to understand that God raises up the poor. He raises up the poor out of the dust. He lifted up the beggar from the dunghill. And he sets them among priests. Let me tell you, I never imagined that the who is who will be calling me to even ask me for prayers. I never imagined that my phone number would be something glorious for somebody to have. I never imagined that when people call, they are so mesmerized that they can even have my number. Today, people may not know your number. How about I prophesy? There are people who will be thirsty just to know your phone number. There are people who will be hungry just to know your phone number. And when they know your phone number, they will feel as though God has visited them in a mighty way in the name of Jesus. Lift up your voice and say hallelujah. God will lift you up out of poverty into super abundant prosperity in the name of Jesus. That no matter the state of your pocket today, God will change your financial status and cause you to have a voice because money gives you a voice. I am telling you without money your voice is stifled. But God is about to deck you with financial breakthrough that he gives you a voice. Have you ever known that when somebody is financially abled, even when they can't speak, people say you're on a point. <laughs> Just money. <laughs> I came to let you know you shall make the difference. People shall be calling you for answers. Lift up your voice and say hallelujah. You are about to be like somebody who is dreaming. Today I give my story. That before I used to give my story crying. Oh my God. Nowadays I wonder, okay, whose story is that? It's me. You mean I was sleeping on the floor? Because God wipes tears. When you hear you shall doubtless return. Rejoicing. You are about to return. Re I, my God, am I in daughters of Zion? I said you are about to return rejoicing in the name of Jesus. Carrying sheaves. Somebody say hallelujah. Number four, the pain of bereavement. The pain of bereavement. Ruth, chapter 1 and verse 20. The Bible says, and she said unto them, call me not Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. There is a pain that sometimes feels like it's impossible to heal. The pain of bereavement. And there are many daughters of Zion going through such pain. People that have lost their husbands at a tender age. Young widows in the house. People that have lost their loved ones. People that have lost people they never imagined possible. People that have lost kids. Words would fail to comfort such a one that is bereaved. But the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 2 and verse 18. In Rama was there a voice heard. Lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children. And would not be comforted because they were not. Because they are not. Or they are no more. Bereavement can be so painful that there is absolutely no way to humanly comfort somebody. Bereavement can be so painful. There is no word to comf of comfort that can heal that heart of somebody that is bereaved. God has proved to be the only one who knows how to go deep into somebody's heart. 
and heal it. I know the pain of losing a child as I look at my baby here. She still hurts so bad. I know the pain of losing a husband. I know many of my daughters that have lost their husbands at tender ages. I know the pain of bereavement, losing a father. I lost my father and yesterday was his uh, memorial. A father that I loved beyond measure. He was too good. A man that taught me morals and values in life. A man that I believe uh, 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 is the one that was used of God to really turn my situation and navigate my life through my youth to become who I became. My father, an amazing man. I know the pain of losing such a one. Never seek one day. Never seek. Never, never, ever, ever seek one day. And two days after sickness, he's dead. I know the pain of somebody who you believed was too strong to even fall sick. And then suddenly they are gone. I want you to understand it's an unbearable pain. When Naomi lost her husband and two sons, she just felt like the world had come to an end. It was so painful, painful that it, she changed her name from Naomi to Mara, a name that means pain. She couldn't be comforted in her mourning. The pain was too much that she decided it was time to go home. It was too much because sometimes in grief, we just need one person, one, to walk with us. To be able to, to, to just speak the life of God over our lives. She had the joy of motherhood one more time. Why? Because her daughter Ruth walked with her. Her daughter Ruth listened and obeyed her. Her daughter Ruth gave her another chance. And you know what's her funny? That when Ruth gave birth, do you know Ruth handed over the child to Naomi? And did you know that Naomi breastfed the child? So God gave her tie, uh, one more chance to feel a child again. Even though she had lost her babies. God gave her a chance. Sometimes you just need one man or one woman who will walk with you until your bereavement is over. Sometimes you just need that person that will encourage you. Sometimes we, 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 we need somebody who will show us that it's not all lost. That our God is still faithful. This is the year of restoration of all things. Somebody say after me, this year I'm being restored of all things. Because Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 17 says, For I will restore health unto you, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, says the Lord. Because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. Seeketh after. But I want you to understand that God is about to heal us in the name of Jesus. Somebody say hallelujah. Number five, and this is where I was going, because I want us to deal with this, because this ultimately breaks everything else in our lives. Is the pain of heartbreak. The pain of heartbreak. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 14. All thy lovers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not. For I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy. With the chastisement of a cruel one. For the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. The other great source of pain is the loss of relationships. And in the above scripture, God speaks about the judgment of the nation of Israel and equates it, equates it to the pain of being forsaken by a lover. He equates it to the pain of being forsaken by a lover. Truth be told, most of us have been somebody's ex. Most of us, if not all, have been in this predicament one season of our life or another. Lift up your voice and say, she's talking to me. You know, you look like you don't even know a man. You even... <laughs> yes, yes. Haki, the way you're looking at me. It's like, hey, mom, me. Listen, most if not all have been somebody's ex. Being left and living, I want you to know. 
as painful as it is, is actually a normal experience. No matter how common it is, walking out of a relationship or finishing a relationship is a pain that is excruciating. It's a pain that is beyond understanding. Many daughters of Zion sleep and wet their pillows every night because of a heartbreak. When you wake up in the morning, you wipe. Somebody is rolling on the floor laughing. You wake up in the morning, you wipe yourself. You put your act together. You dress in uh, red and, and yellow. And you come out. Until you get back home. And go back to the pillow. And you whip yourself to sleep. Many people lie on wet pillows day and night. Tears of a heartbreak. There is nothing sweet about a heartbreak. And to be honest, it is an experience that is so dark that nobody wants to experience it in life, but we all do. And many of us know how, what it means to feel like your heart has been ripped beyond repair. Like there is nobody who's going to really be able to repair your heart. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 14. The Bible says, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? There is nothing trivial about a shattered expect uh, expectation of a broken relationship. A broken heart is a heavy burden to bear. Sadly, love hurts more because of shared dreams. Love hurts more because you have opened yourself completely and given your heart entirely. You have removed yourself. Yani, you are naked and not ashamed. When you give your heart completely to somebody, for a minute, such a heartbreak can send a person to believing there is even no future for them in life. There is even no future. And sadly, there are too many people committing suicide today as we speak because of a love heartbreak, a relationship that is broken. They feel that they have no reason to leave. Such people forget that they had their life before they met this person. And they feel that there is no point of continuing. They also overlook the fact that most of us have survived severe heartbreaks. I want you to look at your neighbor say she's talking to me. Tell your other neighbor me too. I want you to remember something. That today as we sit here at Daughters of Zion, somebody is getting married. Who had been so broken that they had purposed Never again. Today, they are saying, I do. Now, <laughs> I'm not marrying. I will not look at a man ever again. Nonsense, useless. Today, I do with a very sharp voice. I came to let you know the emotional pain of a heartbreak evokes very excruciating pain. Nothing Nothing else matters. No one else matters. You can barely function or think or move for real. We feel removed from anyone and everyone. We feel removed from life. <laughs> when your heart broken, you feel like you're, you're being torn to pieces. You don't want to see any other human being because none of them exists. Only the one that broke your heart. Is the survivor of this existence. <laughs> he is all you see, all you think about. He is, you carry that pain. When our heart is broken, our mind has a very different agenda. And I'm about to talk to us now. All this that I've talked was coming to here, where we are. You can even put it aside. Pay attention now. Listen very carefully. Our mind thinks very differently from our heart. When your heart is broken, 
your mind comes into play. And your mind is actually what keeps you in the heartbreak. What do you mean, Pastor Kathy? Because your mind begins to lie to you. Before I come to the healing balm of Gilead and what Jesus wants to do over your life, let me talk to you about the mind. The mind interferes with your heart. Your heart broken, yes. But the mind steps in and it begins to tell you, you know, you broke with the mightiest man on earth. <laughs> he was the best thing that ever happened after Fanta. There is no other man like him. You start to feel it's true. You, he start, the, the mind starts to tell you, if you don't pursue, he is going to engage with somebody else. So you begin to pursue him and tell him, Nilifanya, what did I do? Listen, listen, listen to me very carefully. You must get a hold of your mind. And begin to get your senses together. And come to reality. Why did you break up? In the first place. He cheated. Good. Get in touch with reality. Take a sip of reality. And begin to think. Like a daughter of Zion. What did he do? He slapped you. Good. Start to think. Like, stop giving excuses. No, his hand was not even coming to my direction. It, listen, it was. <laughs> I did that slap. I couldn't feel. It wasn't even hard. <laughs> hmm? It was, he didn't even mean it. Me, I know. I know he's hard. And me, what I know is I can change him. Baby girl, let me just be honest with you. 25 years later, I'm still trying. You don't change a man. Only his creator can change him. 25 years later, I'm still trying. It doesn't work. 50 years later, my mother told me it didn't work. Can I submit to you? You can never change a man. You need to face reality. What is the reason that caused you to break? And the reason was that he probably did very hurtful things. Face reality. Stop giving excuses and saying he escorts people. Listen. After escorting, he's escorting them up to their house. <laughs> no, there is a Scott like this. There is another one, he's escorting them up to their house and spending the night there. And you're still giving excuses. Niao, 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 your abaya. Listen, face reality. Look at your neighbor, tell them, stop allowing your mind to play tricks on you. Because your mind cheats you. He's a very many, he's this, it's just... And yet you can see from grandfather to father to him. <laughs> story ni moja Hakuna story mbili The story is one But you're still convincing yourself I can change him as well. You need your mind to come To the reality of things And face things Look at your neighbor, tell them face it Our mind has a different agenda And as a result It ends up deceiving us And we get into worse conditions If we want to stop hurting And move on we need to know when not to trust what our mind is telling us. Don't let your mind tell you that that heart was a, was a joke. That heart was real. Don't let it believe it. Don't let your mind lie to you that it was a joke. And don't let your mind lie to you that you, 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 are, you are the one on the wrong. So you need to now work on yourself and every day you're trying to please a man. Everywhere you go, oh yeah, please, just like me. I'm not that bad. Listen, to, so today you are Margaret. Tomorrow you are Jockey. The next day you are Grace. And now you even forgot who you are. Because you're trying to be everything but yourself. So that you can please somebody. Stop having your heart broken again. Face your mind. Face, face, speak to your mind. Let your mind not lie to you. Face the reality and see why it is that you're where you are today in the name of Jesus. And he said to me, I want today to heal the brokenhearted. He came to bind up the brokenhearted. I want you to write this down. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about Chavash. Chavash. C-H-A-V-A-S-H. This is chavach up my broken heart. In other words, chavach is the Hebrew word to bind up, to wrap around, to bind up as a wound, to bandage, to cover, to envelope, to enclose. 
Strong's Dictionary adds it very well and gives it a visual definition. It says to compress or to stop. Our reaction to crushed hearts normally is to wrap up sinews of flesh and vow to ourselves that no man will ever hurt us again. And we cover up ourselves with our own flesh. And we declare and decree that we are building walls. And we put walls that are from here till Timbuktu. When a man just looks and says, I love you like my baby girl over there. And, and, and until somebody told her you must open your mouth and say, I love you. To her it was almost impossible. Why? Because when you're so heartbroken, the last thing you want is to even imagine that you can love or can be loved. And so what do you do? You put walls around yourself. And many daughters of Zion have walls around themselves. Walls of saying, nobody will ever hurt me again. Walls of saying, I have been broken enough. I'm never giving anybody that opportunity. Not anymore. I will never allow anybody to hurt me again. We make self-promises and we say never again will anybody hurt me. And so we act hard. We act tough. We act, you know, uh, you know, Lydia, I'm just remembering you even as I say this. I'm remembering that Lydia was in that place. She came to us. She told us, please don't talk to me about marriage. She was there. She said, don't talk to me about marriage. I've been broken. I was hurt. I was beaten almost every night. He crushed my, my self-esteem. He finished me completely. The last thing I want to see with my eyes is a man. A daughter of mine even entered into gangster. She became a gangster. And she was shooting every man on sight. Because the earth belongs to women. <laughs> Men had hurt her enough. Every man she saw at night, she poor. shot them dead. What are you doing still alive? Because she was raped by her own brothers. She was raped by her cousins. She was raped every time from the age of three. She just remembers being raped by every man. And she, when she grew up into a teenager, the age of 15, she became a gangster. And she was like, why should men leave? All they do is hurt us. And she would shoot them dead. Because there was no point of them living to hurt women again. We resolve in so many dangerous things in our lives. We say we'll never ever open our hearts to anybody. We'll never give ourselves to anybody. We'll never allow anybody else to hurt us. We will never. And we stand up and we say it's over. Nobody shall ever come this close. The minute they come this close, you're looking at them suspiciously. Exactly what do you want? A man comes, tells you I love you. The first thing you do is slap them. Go and tell that to your mother. Who told you I need your love? nonsense get out and unfortunately a lot of ladies are in that place why because of heartbreak you have vowed to yourself i'm never giving myself to anybody again but i want you to understand these self-made promises unfortunately don't just keep love from flowing out it also keeps love from flowing in these are not the ways of God. God has not told us to take vengeance in our hands and declare that we'll never love again. No man shall ever come to us again. We'll never want to see a man again. I tell you, we walked with my daughter uh, Lydia here. We walked for many years and she was saying, I never want to see a man. But there is a God in heaven. I want you to understand that the first thing that God will teach you in this lesson is forgiveness. Forgiveness means, write this down, to excuse a fault. Forgiveness means to excuse a fault. It means to absolve from payment. It means to pardon or to send away. It means to cancel and to bestow favor 
unconditionally. To bestow favor unconditionally. We must ask God for forgiveness. But what does God tell us? What, what does God tell us? I have a condition for your healing. I'm not just going to heal your broken heart. There is a condition. What's the condition? If you forgive not, neither will you be forgiven. And many of us have tied God's hands from healing us because we've held on to bitterness and anger. I am angry. God, you must understand this man is a joker. This woman is a joker. This mother is a joker. This parent is terrible. You must understand what they did to me. This boss is so bad. God, you understand what they did to me. He doesn't understand. He said the only condition is that you must forgive. He says in Matthew 6 and verse 15, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive you your sins. So what must you do? Write this down. Let go of the heart. Bitterness and the disappointment of your life must be released from your heart. Because this is the process of your healing. By reading yourself of the poison that comes with bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, anger, heartache. For you to begin to inhale and exhale love, you must forgive. Little by little, over a period of time, that is when you will begin to look at what hurt you. And the people that hurt you through the eyes of Christ. You can only begin to receive a healing when you begin to see your heart. The people that hurt you with the eyes of Christ. Because that's the only way you are going to be able to even embrace people that have hurt you. He wipes your tears away when you allow your heart to completely forgive, to completely walk in, 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 in forgiveness. All things pass away. You begin to enjoy new things. Why? Because you have completely let it go. And today God said, he is here. He wants to heal you. You've got to release yourself. You've got to break down walls. I want us to take, we're going to take like 30 minutes in this house after the word. And we're going to trust in God. To get down every wall. To break every brokenness. To heal every wounded heart. So that we release and allow God to move over our lives. I want you to know right now. You must make a decision to allow God to bandage you. How is he going to bandage you? Because binding is bandaging. How is he going to bandage you? He's going to bandage you when you expose yourself. Expose Expose your heart. Expose your pain. Expose it to the king of glory. Allow Christ to pour his healing grace over your life. Some of you are angry with God. Some of you are angry with your husbands. Some of you are angry with your parents. Some of you are angry with life. Some of you are angry with your bosses. Some of you are angry and going in pain, feeling pain because of the things that we looked at today. The meaning of broken is reduced to fragments, fragmented, ruptured, fractured, not functioning properly, out of order, doing things out of order. Why? Because you're ruptured, you're torn, you're in pain and it feels hard. It's like your heart has been shattered. The Lord wants you to allow the great physician to begin to do operations. And I saw, I saw as I prayed for you, I have waited on you. I have prayed for you. I have trusted God for you. 
I have believed God to turn it around. And I saw that God is going to begin to do surgeries today. I want you to understand that God, who is the greatest physician that you will ever come to know, is about to perform heart surgeries in this place. I want you to picture him lovingly fitting all those little pieces together. See, when you go through surgery, see you cut and then you begin to stitch. When you're stitching, you stitch the top. But you don't know the work that is going in underneath the stitches. And he said, just like the physician, as a great physician, today he's going to put every fracture back together again. He's going to begin to heal you today again. And as he heals you, I want you to know that healing takes time. But the work is starting right now. When you're stitched together, the top looks stitched. The inside is raw, but that's where the work is. The work begins to take place. The meat begins to hold each other. The bones begin to come together. And the pain begins to diminish. And he said to me, he is going to touch hearts. And he's going to heal. Somebody say, Chabash. Say one more time, Chabash. Chabash. It means to bandage, like I said. And I believe God is reaching down into our innermost beings. And touching our wounds where people don't even know. There are things I see that you've never shared with anybody. In fact, when people stand here and share, you're in total shock. And you're like, ooh. Because it reminds you of your pain all over again. But you're so wounded yet, you cannot share your story. But the Lord says he's going to heal you so much that you will be telling people your story and healing them with your very story. Today you feel raw. Today you feel dejected and in pain. But he sent me to tell you, he's about to heal. According to Psalms 147 and verse 3. The Hebrew word for heal is rafe. R-A-P-H-E. Meaning to heal or to sew together or to mend. To mend and put every brokenness in one piece. We can't physically see the healing that God does inside our bodies. But he is at work of sewing together, stitch by stitch, so that over time we receive a complete healing. This is my message from the Spirit of God. That many of you have not yet gotten married because of that heartache. But today as he binds it together, as he heals you, you begin to see with the eyes of God. Even the very people that hurt you. And you'll begin to walk in total forgiveness. And it will be easy for you to get married. In Jesus name.